Well, it's good to be with you today as uh, my family and I, we got back from a week of family camp at Camp Luther in Three Lakes, Wisconsin. That was uh, just yesterday we got back. And as I spent time there, it reminded me of an experience I had at Camp Luther a couple decades earlier uh, as I was a camp counselor. Uh, I got selected to be uh, one of two co-leaders on a wilderness canoe trip. Uh, Myself, Uh, And actually, Pastor Weber's youngest daughter, Sarah, Susan's uh, sister, uh, we were chosen to be these co-leaders to go on this three-day canoe trip uh, where we'd work through uh, an outfitter about two and a half hours from Camp Luther. Uh, They would set us up with canoes. We'd bring in all of our provisions, coolers, tents, uh, water, and we were going to probably, uh, the way it worked was canoe for about 10 or 12 miles a day, find a campsite, Uh, and then do the same thing the next day, and then on the third day, after about 30 miles or 25 miles, can't remember the exact distance, uh, find a pickup spot right on the river. And so we were taking with us a guest group from Indiana, about 17 teenagers, and their two adult leaders were with us. So uh, altogether, about 21 of us rounded off the group. And so uh, we got going on this trip, and it was a great time. We started off, it was an adventure. I'd never been on the river before, but uh, it was pretty straightforward, or as so I was told, right? And uh, we got to our first spot where we were going to stop for for lunch after having put in about four or five miles. And so we grabbed the cooler, and we opened things up, and we started, oh, we have ham sandwiches for today. So we started making ham sandwiches when we got to about sandwich number 15 or 16, we noticed the supplies had run out. Uh, Like I said, there were 21 of us on that trip. So we kind of got creative, and uh, myself and the other counselor, we didn't eat lunch, and and we thought it was probably a one-off, probably a mistake. And we got to dinner then a couple miles later, and of course, the same thing. And so we're looking at each other going, boy, we're going to get real skinny this trip, right? Because we're not going to be eating much. And so we were deep in the wilderness, And the bottom line was, we did not have enough provisions. Well, a similar thing happens today in our Exodus narrative. The people of Israel are out in the wilderness. They've been there exactly one month. And somebody opens up the cooler and notices that all the stuff they packed from Egypt is now starting to get low. Their food is lacking And like us on the river, they are running out of provisions. So what exactly do they do to remedy this situation? Do they organize a food task force to come up with a plan? Do they put together their smartest and greatest thinkers to put forth a strategic think tank? Or maybe as a community, as an assembly, they might thought of kneeling down and praying to the God who had just led them over the Red Sea. Did they do any of these things? Nah. Instead, verse 16, chapter 16, verse 2 says, the entire Israelite community grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And they went on to say, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt when we, oh, when we sat by pots of meat and Oh yeah, those days where we ate bread, all that we wanted. But now instead, you've brought us into this wilderness to make this whole assembly die of hunger. Did you see what the people did there? They did two things. First of all, they practice redactive history, right? You know what redaction history is? It's when you you change the facts of what happened in the past, right? Some of you had great, great grandpas who would talk about The good old days, you know, where you could buy an automobile for five cents and things like that, right? But they never really brought up the fact that they lived through two world wars and a Great Depression, that not every part of the good old days were good. That's redactive history, when you color things to suit your narrative. And you can see the Israelites are coloring the facts to suit their curtain situation and their narrative. But not only are they changing history... They are also grumbling. And it's so easy to grumble. But have you ever noticed that when you grumble, nothing really gets changed or accomplished? And it doesn't really fix the situation in any way. 
fact, God's not a big believer or promoter of grumbling. In the New Testament, in Philippians chapter 2, Paul would write to the Christians he was writing to, do everything without grumbling and arguing. And so as followers of Christ, we are called to be people who are non-grumblers. And I think we do a pretty good job of not grumbling in our Christian walk. Unless you're caught in traffic. When you're caught in traffic, have you ever noticed how easy it is to grumble? Let me tell you, I was driving back yesterday, and I was grumbling. I got caught behind an association, a convention of cars that all together had decided they were going to do 56 miles per hour on every road. Now, I'm not for speeding, but I am for setting my cruise to 60 and just being able to relax. And I think we have a social contract that you're not supposed to do 56. I don't know. I could be wrong on that. I'm going to go talk to some cops. They might tell me otherwise, but I think even the cops say, yeah, 57, you know. But I was grumbling, and I mean, I was kind of embarrassed because my wife and daughter were hearing me, and then I would catch myself, and I would stop grumbling so they could hear me, but God could still hear me grumbling inside. So I didn't really stop grumbling, I just stopped audibly grumbling. But, you know, traffic's the one exception where I think sometimes we become grumblers, you know, unless, unless at work, I guess, is another place we grumble. We grumble about our boss or our coworkers, or maybe the workload that we have to do that day. But, but when work gets done, well, we do grumble about our spouses sometimes. And, and I guess you could say we grumble about our kids. And, uh, but that would probably be the limit of where most Christians... Well, sometimes I grumble about my house because things leak or it's not as new as my neighbor's house. Or how about your car? You grumble about your car because it doesn't do all the new fedangled things that the new ones do. And then, of course, your neighbor, it's worth grumbling about them because they always leave their lights on when you're trying to enjoy it. You know? and, and then, of course, you know, there's the weather, right? Here at Redeemer, I can guarantee you six months ago, there was somebody in this church who grumbled that it is too cold out. And I guarantee you today, there's somebody in this church who will grumble, it's too hot out, right? Because reality is... As sinful human beings, we grumble a lot too. The problem with grumbling is we find ourselves minimizing what God is doing to provide for us in his providing hand. When we catch ourselves being incessant grumblers, we find ourselves playing the role of ungrateful, spoiled, heavenly children. And God doesn't want us to act that way. He wants us to act as children of his who are grateful for all that he provides us. And so with the balance of our time, what I'd like to do is just talk about how God does provide. I'd like to focus in, not by any means is this an exhaustive list, but four pretty key ways that I see God providing in our lives and also spelled out to some extent in the scriptures that we're looking at here in the book of Exodus. And the first thing that we notice is that God provides through his creation, doesn't he? I mean, if you think about it, there is so much that God has provided us in, in creation. That, that bagel that I just took from the church kitchen, right? That didn't just come from the church kitchen. That didn't just come from the grocery store but somehow that came from the grains of the field, from supplies that God gives us through creation. Do you know that it's God who gives us fruits and vegetables? That if you want to know where, where pork and chicken and fish and beef come from, it ultimately comes from, from God. God's the one who gives us milk and, and water and, and, and herbs and spices to help us with certain things and, and to give us oils and creams for our bodies. And he's the one who has provided minerals and elements to create technology and medicines such as uh, steels and alloys and, and all sorts of wonderful things that help people. And not to mention all the beautiful parts of his creation like the way the sun is out and it's going to be 80 degrees today, that's part of God's provision to us. It's God's provision to show us mountain majestic tops, right? To give us animals to be domesticated, to be our companions. Those are all provisions from God. If you've ever gone out and caught a 20-pound king salmon, that's from God. 
If you've ever show, shot a trophy whitetail buck during hunting season, that's from God. If you've ever seen the undulation of a green and your eyes read it so you could hit a 42-foot putt for birdie on your favorite hole, that's from God. Probably a little luck, too, but from God. God gives us so much through creation. In fact, when Adam and Eve were created, he told them, I give you every seed-bearing plant as food because God was providing. And then again, after the flood, he told humankind that he would give us every animal as food. And today in the book of Exodus, we see that not only does God provide in so many usual ways in creation, but God even chose to provide for his people in an unusual way through creation as he rained down manna upon them. It was so that they might know that he truly was the God who provides for them and also to test their faith as they would follow his instructions to be provided for. So God definitely provides through his beautiful creation in so many ways that if we just think about it, we realize, yeah, he's providing for me daily that I don't even recognize. Here's a second way, though, that God provides for his people, for all people, for that matter, is he provides through work. And in Exodus, did you notice that when the manna rained down, it didn't just rain into their pockets. It rained down and they had to go out and gather the manna. God made it a blessing for them to actually work. Just like in the creation at the garden, God told Adam and Eve that they were to work the garden, right, as a, a blessing. That means that work is a blessing, not a burden. I know there's times when our work can be a burden or burdensome, but overall, God uses our work, our occupations, our vocations in life so that we can be provided for. Of course, there's ways where this is abused. We all know people who are too lazy to work, people who are gaming some sort of support system, and you say, that's not right, and that person is maybe being taken care of, and, and that's not what God has intended. We also know people who are on the other side of the coin where work is so important to them that they put everything behind work, and we call them workaholics because they feel that work is the most important thing in their life. See, work can be a blessing from God, but it can also be an idol of self-reliance. As we find ourselves working and we say things like, well, I'm the one that provides for myself. Or I'm a self-made man. Or nobody is ever going to take care of me. I'm going to make sure of it. See, when we talk like that, we don't realize that it's really God who provides for us through our occupations and through our work. In fact, he had to tell the Israelites this later in the book of Deuteronomy when he said, you may say to yourself, it's by my power and my own ability that I've gained this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God who gives you the power and the ability to gain wealth. Even our schooling, our experiences, our aptitude towards traits, our understanding of difficult scientific thoughts or, or medicines or math, whatever it is that you practice or have practiced in your career is a gift from God so that you could provide and be provided for in your family. And so as I was thinking about how God provides for us in work, here I am on vacation and I realized that the corollary to that is God also chooses to provide for us through rest. That as we rest, God provides restoration and renewal through that gift of rest. That's why God modeled for us early on in Genesis, the creation of the world, a Sabbath day for his people to rest. Because God places a high value on people being renewed, on them taking time off, taking time away from their labor, taking time to be with their family, taking time to to, to maybe check out for a while on vacation or those types of things. You see, God has a very important balance that he wants us to strike between work and rest because through rest, he also provides for us. He gives us mental health through rest, physical health. He gives us spiritual renewal. All those things come to us as we find that balance that God has struck for us between work and rest. And I'll tell you, when we get that out of balance 
then we don't receive everything that God intends to provide for us. But I would say the last and most important way that God provides for his people is through love. And Paul, the apostle in Romans, says that so clearly in chapter 8 where he says, God did not even spare his son, but he offered him up for us all. How will he not also with him, his son, also give us and grant us everything? In other words, what Paul is saying is that if God's willing to give you Jesus Christ as a gift, what gifts is he holding back from you? What things are too big of asks from our God if he's willing to give you his greatest treasure, which is his only begotten son? If he loves you that much, how much more does he love to provide for even what we see as some of the more insignificant things in our lives? That's why the most famous Bible verse that is quoted, John 3.16, starts off with, For God so loved the world that he provided us with his son, that whoever would believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's why Jesus, during his earthly ministry, talked about, you see how your heavenly Father uh, gives and provides for these lilies of the field that are here today and gone tomorrow, these sparrows from the sky that fall sometimes. He says if he cares and provides for them, how much more out of love for you O oh, you of little faith, will your heavenly Father provide for you? And that's what he does through his love. Provides his son to give us the thing that we need most. Forgiveness and a hope for a future to be with our creator. Back to that canoe story. We survived. We made it three days. We didn't eat as much as usually we would eat on a three day when you're when you're kind of canoeing all day. I did, when I got back to Camp Luther, talk to the, the girl who was in charge of providing our provisions, and she was a college girl uh, about my age. And I asked her, I said, you know, we were really short on food. What, what happened there? Did you guys just forget, or did you get the wrong number, or what happened? And she said, well, you know, I was thinking about it, and they gave me a number, but I realized you had a bunch of high school girls with you. This is what she said. And I know high school girls don't like to eat that much, and they really don't like ham, so I cut it back by about a third, and I just figured that that would make sense. And I probably, in a less than eloquent way, responded to her, well, that may be true that girls, according to your opinion, do not eat as much as boys when there is Subway and McDonald's and Applebee's there as choices. But when you're out in the wilderness, you need even ham as your provisions. You know, that kitchen provider did not truly know what we needed to be provided with. But our heavenly provider truly knows what we need to be provided with. He's able to provide for you. He's willing to provide for you, and he has proven that he will provide for you daily. As we find that he works through us through this various means, may we put our trust and our faith in the God who gives us all of our provisions. Amen. Join me in prayer as we bow our heads. Lord, we thank you that you are the heavenly provider, that we never have to question that you have somehow mis- calculated what we need but lord instead you know exactly what we need and you are wiser than us and you know when we need it and and whether we truly need it for that lord we commend our faith to you and we place that trust in you lord help us to use the various means you place in our lives to receive those provisions and as we receive them not to become arrogant or self-reliant but to become dependent and thankful for your hand in everything we see and do and receive. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, the greatest provision we've ever received, a Savior. Amen.